thank you for joining us today for a lively discussion on how organizations can uncover targeted risk information on a business or a person. The LexisNexis Due Diligence Product Suite enables quick and effective initial due diligence without impacting the overall customer experience, as many organizations turn to automation to enhance efficiencies. Our speakers today are Cameron Jones, Ricardo Aragon, and Camilla Yellitz. Cameron is the director of RSM, anti-money laundering, and regulatory compliance product, pra, regulatory compliance practice. He has worked in financial institutions, government, and law enforcement for over 25 years and in financial crime software analytics organizations with a career targeted focus specific to BSA, AML, fraud, and cyber operations. Ricardo is a subject matter expert at LexisNexis Risk Solutions in the area of anti-money laundering and sanctions compliance. He also consults with clients on workflow, best practices, product usability, product enhancements, and data content. He has worked in anti-money laundering compliance for 15 years and has received industry certification from the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, or ACAMS, the American Bankers Association, or ABA, and the Florida International Bankers Association, or FIBA. Camilla is a financial crime compliance consultant for LexisNexis Risk Solutions and plays an integral role in educating both financial institutions and corporations about the critical importance of compliance, as well as the reputational and fiduciary damage that can result from noncompliance. Her primary interest is in economic sanctions and how that impacts U.S. and global banks and businesses. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping details. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentations into the Q&A interface. Our speakers will do their best to answer all of them. If you are having any issues with the presentation or media player, please press F5 on your PC to refresh your screen. And now over to you, Rick. Welcome. Thanks very much, Mary, and uh, welcome to everyone who's attending the uh, webcast today. I'm uh, glad to be here and uh, hope to be able to share some uh, interesting and helpful uh, pieces of information and, and considerations on customer due diligence and its place in the overall workflow. Um, what we'd like to do, uh, first of all, is to look at the agenda, and then I'll pass it over to, uh, to Cam to, to get us started. Uh, we're going to look at an overview. Cam's going to go over the current state of the industry and different trends that he's seeing. And then we're going to look at some considerations, things to think about when you're considering uh, automating the use of data, advanced analytics, and some of the different uh, associated processes uh, when we talk about customer due diligence, like transaction monitoring and negative news screening. We're going to look at some challenges uh, that are inherent in the existing approaches to customer due diligence. And then finally, we're going to talk about some solutions that LexisNexis has developed to help address these challenges. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cam for the overview. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so as we start this off, uh, with what you see here, I thought it would be helpful to keep in mind one of the primary reasons we invest much time and effort into our risk management department. Um, you know, while we know our programs are ultimately here to protect our customers, protect our communities, we also know there's a heavy reputational risk and fines that really come and impact our organization. So based on the numbers you see here on the screen, uh, there's a growing trend in penalties and cost of compliance from 2018 to 2020. Uh, if you look at this, we have about 58 penalties that were assessed globally in 2019 with about $8 billion in fines. And just in 2018, there were only about 29 fines with about $4 billion, or sorry, 29 penalties with about $4 billion in fines. So I find it very interesting because as we move into 2020, I think it's very exciting. Uh, we're just halfway through the year, and the fines are at $5.6 billion globally already. And in APAC alone, where it was at $3.5 million, the fines have increased to $4 billion. So we spent about, you know, a huge portion in APAC and really spending – uh, between getting the fines and the cost of compliance behind APAC and what we're trying to support, it, it's a huge increase. Uh, so we spent about $180 billion globally on financial crime compliance operations in general, but I would say at least in the U.S. from 2018 to 2019, we only saw about a billion-dollar increase. Granted, that's a lot of money, but 
It'll be interesting to see what the 2020 statistics will portray uh, when we catch up to 2021. So here you also noticed, I've noted a, a few more interesting finds in 2019 to 2020, uh, but more so than the finds themselves. I'm not really interested in the dollar amounts for this, but it's who the penalties are against. Uh, we've gone from smaller institutions to some of the largest banks uh, that we have here, and we've seen the penalties against individuals and the expansion into other areas of industry. We have money services businesses, FinTech. It's all starting to fall under the purview of government and regulators, and it's starting to touch all of us at this point. So it's no longer a, a you know, when are they coming or if they're coming. I mean, they're here. They're coming for us. Uh, so when we talk about that, we want to make sure that we're all in sync with each other. We're all sharing the best practices. And, you know, I think this really does just demonstrate that we're all in this together. You know, we're working with our regulators. We're working together to understand, you know, what they're looking for, what are our risks. And we want to be able to work as a community as well within the financial institution. So with that said, I mean, I think some people probably have heard about FinCEN. They, they provided an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, the proposals under consideration are really intended to provide financial institutions with greater flexibility uh, to really be able to al allocate your resources um, and help you align a little bit better the priorities of what industry and government are looking for. So it's supposedly uh, to help us understand and really provide an enhanced effectiveness and efficiency of our AML program. Uh, I think this came out in about around September 16th, I believe. Um, but they were seeking comments to really understand how incorporating an effective and reasonable design uh, for the AML program to help institutions really start allocating the resources. Now, I've really talked to quite a few people around this and it's interesting because, I mean, this is affecting you know, banks, casinos, insurance, money service businesses. It's, it's really hitting everyone across the board. But my question is, and what a few colleagues are trying to start vetting and talking about, it's like, well, how does the regulatory industry define this? How can we uh, be able to better uh, understand what the regulators are looking for? What are those best practices? Or are the regulators going to come in and tell us, well, you don't need 10 people for this. You only need five. They're trying to understand a little bit more what does that detail look like and we're talking about being advised as to how to allocate our resources. So there's kind of a pro and con to that, but on one hand, you know, hey, that's great. I've got, you know, a regulator come in to help me support. I need more resources to help really provide a strong program. But then you have the flip side of that where our regulators come in and saying, well, you don't need that many resources. Why do you have that many people? So there, it's kind of a double-edged sword in that respect. So what I'd like to kind of discuss here, we see that there are several workflows on the screen, and these are about, you know, your customer. So we all understand the requirements, and there are so many nuances out there um, in how we deploy a sufficient KYC program. And I'm not going to walk through these workflows. I want everyone to be able to see how they vary from organization to organization. Everybody has uh, the same type of workflows. We all have similar policies, similar procedures. Um, but what I do want to discuss is the impact these processes have on our business. It's not so much the operations, while that most certainly does have an effect on our resources, but what I really mean is the customer experience. When you're trying to buy a car, when you're you know, trying to open a bank account, we keep coming back to particular organizations because it's not only the cost of doing business, it's really the ease of making it happen. Uh, it really should be simple. It should be convenient. It really should be seamless. Um, asking question after question, filling out the documentation, it, it just it really gets to be a little bit heavy uh, for the users, for our customers. And you know we're trying to figure out, out how can we better limit that impact on our customers but still be able to fulfill a proper know your customer program. And I think we want to work smarter. We want to, we don't want to work harder. We want to be cost effective. So, you know, here's where we kind of unite the technology, the information that is available, and automation around that. We want to provide an outstanding customer service, uh, you know, provide that great experience because that's something we all look for. Uh, but, and, you know, are we running our valuable customers through repeated workflows and a series of questions? You know, is that too much? And is that the answer? Well, we don't believe it is. I mean, honestly, you don't want to sit here and answer question after question. I just tried doing that with an insurance. Uh, life insurance a few days ago, actually. 
And literally, it didn't tell me what my progress was. It just kept saying, you're almost there. Well, it kept telling me that for about 15 minutes, and I was answering question after question until it really got super personal. And to the point of asking who my doctor even was and their contact information, I'm like, you know what? This isn't for me. So I literally stopped right there in the middle of it. And, of course, I'm getting email after email saying, please, come back. You know, finish your application. But it literally, I sat there for almost half an hour, and it it got to be too much for me. And, you know, I may get back later on, potentially, but it wasn't easy for me. It wasn't convenient, and it provided a poor experience. I couldn't tell where I was in the dynamics of the workflow. I couldn't tell how close I was to finishing because I thought if I only had one more question to answer after that one, I might have went ahead and done it, but I didn't know. Um, so I really think, you know, as we move on with this discussion, we'll discover there's data, there's methodology that we really just haven't taken full advantage of yet. And Cam, could you comment also on your view of the uh, the role of fintechs in in putting this focus on the customer experience? I know you've done some work in that area. Sure, absolutely. Um, I've, I've done work in fintech myself, um, and with a fintech present, I think it's a very it's amazing how it's had an impact on our industry because. Working, coming from the banking side, I've worked you know, for the last 25 years in banking and technology and regulatory side of the house. But looking at how FinTech has come in, they really help us drive the automation. Um, they help us engage better with the customer because, you know, in banking, you know, growing up in the culture of the banking environment is really for us to provide one-on-one -on -one service. So when online began, you know, banks are trying to stay with it, but, you know, so large. Some of us are really big. So then even from the small front frontage side, it's really hard to get that one-on-one -on -one with your customers at times. And so the online channels are growing tremendously. And the relationships and the partnerships we formulate with some of the FinTech firms um, to help us drive that automation, to provide additional products that we normally wouldn't be able to handle ourselves, um, really has made a huge difference in this industry. So now with our FinTech uh, colleagues, um, being able to really provide, I think, that piece of automation, that piece of streamlining, being able to, they're a little bit more agile than we're able to be on the banking side, and having those types of partnerships to enhance our products, enhance our revenues coming in, to really, honestly, enhance our marketing as well, um, to kind of share all of that together has been very beneficial for both parties. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for the overview and for those comments. Um, let's move on now to some considerations that uh, I think are important when we're talking about CDD and automation and using analytics. There's some associated processes that we need to keep in mind, and, and one of them is uh, suspicious activity monitoring. The whole point of the BSA is to be able to identify and report suspicious activity. And in an ideal world, all of the alerts that we look at, well, I guess in an ideal world, we wouldn't have financial crime, but in the world that we live in, um, every alert would be productive. We'd, we'd look at what's produced by the system and we'd say, hey, this really needs to be dug into. This is worth the time investigating it. And we know that that's not the case. And some of the, the issues with that is just the, the amount of, of data that is being produced and you know, finding the needle in the haystack is not easy. Um, there are some uh, attempts, and usually by larger finance institutions that have the, the resources, um, at least this is what we've seen, to uh, bring to bear advanced analytics, um, AI, machine learning. Those are all kind of buzzwords that we're, we're hearing a lot in the industry. I think we're still in the nascent stage, still uh, uh, very aspirational. Um, but most financial institutions, they don't have those resources, are – stuck in rules-based uh, type uh, transaction monitoring, and, and it's very difficult to get all the value out of those, uh, those processes um, without having access to data that may go beyond what you would have in traditional transaction monitoring. I mean, you've got the, the, the transactions and the information that the customer provides you, and that, that goes a certain uh, way but it doesn't allow you for a lot of flexibility and automation because you're just limited in data. So Cam, again, I know that you've um, worked in transaction monitoring. That's a, a subject that's uh, near and dear to your heart. Um, could you make some comments on what you're seeing in terms of automation and some opportunities there? Oh, absolutely. Um, 
I think this is very fascinating as well. I'm a huge proponent for predictive analytics, machine learning, robotic process automation. Uh, I could talk for hours really around the topics, but uh, there's a number of pros and cons really around the benefits and the impacts these tools can really have on our operations. Um, but, you know, even with machine learning and the likes of artificial intelligence, the machine can only learn based on the limited amount of data that we usually map to it. But I'm very conscientious when I say map because it's really data we provide to it. Um, so today, you know, while we really do allude to the notion that we take full advantage of all the information we collect and store in these databases, the data ponds, the data ocean, uh, we, we really are, we have a limited amount of information coming in. We still limit ourselves because we're still making it a bit harder and more difficult, a little bit more siloed as well. Um, so, you know, but having worked in monitoring technologies and financial crime, I think, you know, we're primarily limited as to how we monitor these transactions. And sometimes we really do make minimal use of the customer information, except in a manual fashion, um, or like I mentioned, in a very siloed effect. Um, we've got the bits and pieces there, but sometimes not everything talks together uh, from our technology side, from our system, and sometimes even in operation. We perform enhanced due diligence, and we don't seriously take advantage of the information we really have access to out there, you know, in, in the world to really be able to monitor and really do predictive outcomes, to really understand outside of even the transactional-based activities, how can I better predict for my customer based off who they are? Um, and, you know, we can leverage all the parts of the KYC workflow that we saw earlier uh, to be more efficient and more effective. But, you know, we perform these semi-annual or sometimes annual reviews of our customers, hoping to update a score, push them from high to low, from low to high. And if it's low to high, I mean, honestly, we do that only maybe every few years. Um, if they're low coming in, sometimes we're, we put them on a longer schedule. And we only really look at them and maybe move them up if we're tipped off around something. So we focus a good deal on transactional rules and the kind of categorization of our customers by placing them in buckets. So even in those buckets, everyone is unique. Anything can change in someone's life. Tomorrow I could go out and, you know what, I could get arrested for tax evasion. Was there anything that led up to that? Was there any indicators that I would have given that someone could have predicted that was going to happen? Um, but no, because I look like everyone else in the bucket, so why should anyone have to pay attention to me? Um, so, you know, we have access to additional individual data points, but it's kind of lost in the workflow dynamics because it's either too large um, or we don't know how to apply it to our monitoring programs except really in more rudimentary fashion. So um, I believe we are evolving. I think we're getting there, I think, with each generation of technology we develop. Um, and I think we have advances to make, but I think it's really the unification of our data and our technologies and our operations that's really going to play an important role as we continue to move forward when we discuss, you know, the artificial intelligence, the RPA, how we develop a you know, more cost-effective compliance area. And I really do believe that incorporating the technology with the operational aspect will not only lower the risk of the doing business with the firm, but also impact our customer uh, efficiency and our customer experience in the long run to drive better revenue. Yeah, thanks for those comments, Cam. Let's let's transition over to another aspect that I think is important that also has been getting some attention from firms that, that have the resources to apply advanced analytics, and that's uh, looking at negative news. And Camilla, I know with your background as a banker and uh, criminal uh, researcher, um, you've got some thoughts about this. So I'll uh, turn it over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rick, and thanks, Cam. Uh, and great to be with you all today. So thank you for everyone's time um, who's listening in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just wanting to talk through this, you know, when we were um, chatting about this presentation, putting it together beforehand, you know, something that sort of stuck with me from previous experience, as well as some of the things that have been going on in the media today, with some of the um, sort of perhaps big releases we've been finding out about over the last couple of weeks, um, these situations, almost like these outliers, right, that I'm calling a sample size of one. And so I think if it, we take a step back, we think about what Cam's talked about, you know, from the overview, from the, you know, overall sort of KYC process, right, from onboarding to risk rating to verifying and validating and collecting all of that documentation, 
you know, and then I think, um, Rick, you were talking about, you know, from a transaction monitoring perspective, or, you know, we then watch the customers or our vendors or our suppliers, we watch their behavior, their activity, right, within our systems. And we would sort of think about the use of advanced analytics and the data that we're gathering to be able to say, okay, can we form a sort of reasonable belief that we know what's going on with that customer and that we're working towards identifying those suspicious transactions. And part of that, of course, we talk about from a negative news monitoring perspective. You know, generally, we always sort of have to um, think about, you know, what do we define as negative news? Um, you know, how do we do that in an efficient way? How do we do that without impacting our resources that we have within our teams today? And so this sort of sample size of one discussion came to me um, as part of that KYC process, but really being able to sort of manage and react from an ongoing perspective. Um, and I sort of, like Rick, you said, as a former criminal justice um researcher and looking back on the things that we used to do, I mean, sample size of one was like, ah, no, you can't, you know, you can't build a program or build policy or procedure around something that's happened on a one-off. And so thinking of those big cases um, in the media, you know, whether it's um, individuals that have been involved in, you know, fraud-related or Ponzi schemes, right, um, whether it's um, information that's been released through a consortium of journalists that have identified, you know, really some um, some practices that have been going on on a global scale to launder and facilitate, you know, the movement of illicit funds. Ultimately, what we're, it all comes down to is going that one step, perhaps, beyond what we're doing today and looking, actually, at the characteristics of our customer. So... Let me, and let me explain what I mean by this, right? So we, we will collect inf certain information. If you're a bank, you're going to collect very specific information. You're going to verify and validate that. You might collect some documentation. You might apply a risk score, and you get put into those buckets, right, that, that Cam was talking about earlier. Um, and then we wait to see 30, 45 days later, maybe, oh, has anything uh, suspicious happened? Well, in actual fact, you already have the data, and we're hopefully going to demonstrate this when we talk about the due diligence product suite in a little bit here, um, or, or a little later on. But you already have the information to be able to actually dig in to that identity, to that consumer, to that business, to that vendor or supplier, and actually look at the characteristics of that identity and determine straight away if this is something that you actually, or that there are characteristics that are actually too risky for you, right? I've already been involved in some sort of fraud schemes. I've already been involved in money laundering. Well, there's already, and my, my favorite one on a business side, the characteristics of this business indicate this could be a shell or a shelf company. That's a big red flag. That allows you to then to be able to manage that risk appropriately without having to wait on something to pop up in the news or social media to blow something up or, you know, to be able to wait for transactions. So I think really here what I wanted to pause on was really and sort of perhaps set up our conversation in a couple of slides here is talk about how we can do these things, identify risk without relying on our customer providing that information, without impacting our manual resources, and really digging into the risk that we care about by utilizing the attributes. And that's really digging into those, those characteristics that are often red flags of behavior that we in the future may want to may want to avoid. So Rick, I'll pass it back to you. Hey Rick, maybe you're on mute. This is Mary and just want to make sure that we can't hear oh. you. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you, you Mary. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> So one thing I did want to mention, um, based on that last uh, that's the last slide, is that while some of the notorious cases that you know hit the, the global media, you know you need to make sure that 
you know, if there's a Ponzi scheme, you're not, you know, banking the, the person that's involved in the, in the Ponzi scheme or what do you have sufficient, um, you know, controls to, to detect if that's happening in your finance institution. Um, 90% of all criminal uh, 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 cases are brought in state court. So there's a lot of activity that might be more relevant to you, depending on the size of your finance institution and your location, than what you're getting just in, in, in news monitoring. So I wanted to bring that up. Now, with the current slide, what I wanted to focus on was there is a, a continuum in risk information, and it, it goes along two axes. On the y-axis, you have the breadth of content. You have at the top of that unstructured media, where you can search for anything that you want to. In, in news sources, in Google, in, in, in vendor sources like LexisNexis. You can search for anything that you want to. But there's a challenge to that because there's so much data and you need to determine the relevancy and materiality of that data to your subject. If you think about just the, the word strike, it could be a baseball term, it could be an act of physical violence, it could be the result of a labor dispute. And it's hard to know when you're looking at unstructured media. And so you tend to get a lot of false positives. If you look at the, the next type of data, structured profiles, that's where you've got now curated data. We've got a, a product, the World Compliance Database, that is uh, composed of structured profiles. So you get more specific um, because we're, you know, you're putting in uh, personal identifiers, uh, you're, you're categorizing the information, um, so it, it makes a little bit more sense when you're screening. Um, so you're getting a, a part way there, but you are uh, really at the mercy of the editorial policy of that, that database and, and the inclusion criteria. So there are some things that might be relevant for you that are not included. And then you get to attributes, which are specific data elements that tie back to a unique entity, whether it be a person or a business. And that is really where you're able to apply data in some of these other processes that we've been talking about, suspicious activity monitoring and, and negative news, um, as well as just your regular CDD uh, processes. Because by tying back to a specific identity, you're able to get information that really is, you know, almost free of false positives um, because because we're looking at a specific person, a specific identity that we're tying this data back to. And there's not these other processes that typically have to go through of investigation, whether it's negative news or, or suspicious activity monitoring. You need to determine, is this my subject? Okay, so um, part of the challenges that the industry faces is the way the data is presented or organized. And by getting to an attribute, you're able to then increase your efficiency drastically and reduce your false positives. So that's going to set up our following discussion, but let's talk about the challenges that the current approach to CDD brings with it. And let's first talk about onboarding. Cam, I'm going to turn it back over to you um, to, to talk about this uh, first step in, um, in, in getting done to your customer. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, so I would say, you know, given in today's environment, especially with this pandemic, everybody's had to make some huge adjustments. Uh, so I think, you know, with the way we use um, online channels and how popular and how uh, we started developing it out even further to be better used by our customers, you know, I think we have the ability to get the information. But right now, I think as we're talking about what we're doing today, we're trying to force fit some of the operational aspects into the technology. And so by that, I mean every these five questions, and I'm making this up, these five questions I ask my customer every time I'm face-to-face, -face, I'm opening their account, I ask them these questions, that how do we get in technology? Well, we need to think a bit more broadly than that. Um, so, you know, because even if someone's giving me this information, I can't really validate it. I can't really confirm it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really difficult to do that, you know, but this brings us back to customer experience. You know, how much is too much to ask from them when we're doing these onboarding uh, protocols and programs? Um, so I think with today's environment, either whether it be through online, whether it even be face-to-face, -face, and we're doing this one-on-one, -on -one, we still need the extra step. We need that 
extra due diligence that will help us understand the risk around that particular customer, somehow apply that to our monitoring technology, and be able to really leverage that as a predictive outcome for how we manage that relationship. Rick, are you back on mute? I, was, I thought really everyone, I thought I was gonna be the one on mute for everybody, just saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be really good about not having background noise, but I'm <laughs> muting myself, sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so let's go to the next step of uh, the process, looking at, uh, you know, once we've onboarded a customer, now we need to monitor them. We need to look at them over the, the life cycle of the relationship that you have with that customer. So, Camilla, I'll turn it over to you for your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, you know, I think this is always sometimes the hardest one, right, especially if you're a large organization. Um, perhaps you've got, you know, perhaps multiple channels, right, multiple sort of customer bases that you're trying to manage um, because you're trying to do the right thing, especially if you're a financial institution, is to manage um, and maintain that updated information um, on your existing customer base, so you are capturing those risk changes, and it's hard to do. And I think, I think we just really those are the elements that we were talking about previously. Like, how do you do that? Not just from a onboarding perspective, like Cam just talked about, but for also from that ongoing perspective. And, and my favorite example here is is always. Um, you know, when I opened up my bank account, when I moved to the U.S., you know, I, I picked a, a bank that had an ATM on campus that I didn't have a much, that much money as a student, but I picked <laughs> to take out. But, you know, that I picked that bank. Um, I knew I was a student for two years. I don't think my bank knew that I was no longer a student at the two-year mark, right? So the point being, and I, I always wonder how many... You know, if you looked at your, your um, records or your accounts today or your relationships today, right, how many have you actually touched base with in, in a meaningful way to be able to manage that change, that natural change in a consumer's, um, you know, really customer life cycle, that client life cycle. And, you know, I think, I think we do this today in a couple of different ways, and there may be a variation on, on these themes you know, as I'm talking through these uh, from the audience. But, you know, you might look at them from, you know, obviously transaction monitoring, right? Something triggers and that may, you know, create then a review of that relationship, right? Or the review of that account or that customer. Um, it, it may be something like a triggering event, right, that you've defined at your own institution to be when this, happens, this event happened, then we will, you know, review that sort of customer, that relationship. So those could be things like, you know, I'm changing my address from a domestic address um, to a foreign address or a non-US address, I should say. So triggering events, um, transaction monitoring, you know, relying on the customer as well to inform us of those changes, um, which is always, as we know, not the best. Um, you know, I can certainly hold my hand up and say maybe I didn't notify my bank soon enough that I was no longer um, a, a student. But all of these come together, it just becomes really hard. So, how, you know, we go back and we look at the buckets and we have processes for high-risk customers, um, you know, defined by either some sort of product or service or activity that they're doing, um, you know, and, and we sort of focus on those, perhaps the type of, the type of customer they are. Um, to our organization defines those. And then you might do something around some of those ones, whether you have those triggering events or you perhaps a transaction monitoring alert generates something or a commercial banking relationship, right, on a yearly basis. You may have created some sort of touch point um, just to make sure from an AML perspective things are in order. But that often leaves a vast number um, of relationships that you manage that just don't get touched, that don't get reviewed because it's almost impossible to do so. So again, when I think about the, the guidelines and the requirements for this, um, you know, I think there's a way in which the attributes are going to be able to really support this in a scalable way 
um, to be able to help manage that change and that risk. And I think this is leading on to, uh, to Rick for you to talk about then how, you know, you can do that alert management or one of the challenges we see today with alert management as well. Yeah, thanks, Camilla. And, and I, I think really what I wanted to do is just talk about um, when you get to the end of the process, you know, we talk about onboarding, we talk about monitoring, and then at the end of the process when an alert has been generated, um, what type of information do you have available to, to investigate that alert? Now, obviously, you've got the information from the transaction monitoring system itself. You've got the information from your, your customer. Um, but it oftentimes now is up to an investigator relying on you know, uh, online portals and, and tools where you pull reports and the information that you need in order to investigate it's not in a format that you, could, you can scale with. And so in order to manage those loads more effectively, you really need to have that data in a format that allows you to apply it to all the alerts that are being generated and not just after the fact when you're uh, in the investigative process. So really what we're talking about here is putting the pieces together, putting together the information that you have on the inside of your four walls um, as a financial institution or, or another corporate uh, entity and bringing that together with information that is sourced from the outside. So your customers live you know, most of their life outside of your four walls. And so that's the type of information that we need to be able to, uh, to access and to take advantage of in order to be able to get a complete picture of customer risk. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about uh, some of the solutions that LexisNexis developed in order to address the issues that uh, we've spoken of when, when speaking of uh, CDD, gathering information on your customers and all that information as it flows through the different processes, onboarding, monitoring, alert management. And the solution that we want to talk about right now is called the due diligence product suite. And the, the product suite is composed of three different products. The first is a set of attributes. So attributes, and we talked about this in the risk information continuum earlier as being a characteristic or a piece of information that ties back uniquely to an entity, whether it be a person or a business. And so really eliminating that need to uh, to do further investigation, um, you, you, you're very confident that that piece of information ties back to that person. The other products that are associated with the attributes in the product suite are reports. So the, the attributes themselves are just indexes, so it's a number with a definition. But if you see a number with a definition that concerns you, you want to know the underlying detail. So there's a, a set of uh, reports for businesses and reports for uh, for individuals that allow you to get the, the deep dive information um, that are contained in those descriptive indexes. So I'm going to turn it over to Camilla to talk about some of the common use cases that we're seeing in, in our customer base with the uh, due diligence attributes. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Rick. So, yeah, I think I, I won't re read through these sort of line by line here, and hopefully from our conversation, you gleaned where maybe these would sit. Um, certainly at that moment, at the onboarding stage of a new relationship um, that you could use in real time to help support your, your CIP processes or your, you know, your onboarding process that, processes that you may have and supporting, right, that ultimate risk rating. So that it goes back to what I was saying earlier, like I can verify and validate that I know that's the address and, you know, dare I mention this in the KYC process, they have a great credit score and all of these things, this is going to be a great customer, but actually looking to the Rick's point, looking at the characteristic of that identity to identify has there been um, something here of note related to AML risk. So uh, as part of a risk rating process, again, just as generally as part of that onboarding um, process, being able to use the attributes as well um, from that ongoing perspective, right? You, looking at that, those vast customer databases that you may have and being able to focus in 
on attributes that you care about to be able to monitor for changes in a meaningful way. Um, also being able to use those reports that, that Rick was just talking about. So the attributes are sort of coming in in like a real-time API or batch process, but then looking at the reports that you can access within your investigations, FIU, you know, due diligence processes that you may have, um, CDD, EDD, or some sort of vendor due diligence, supply chain due diligence you may have. Um, and then it just in regards to being able to look at it potentially from any type of remediation asset too, right? So uh, look backs, um, remediation efforts, perhaps if you're doing mergers and acquisitions as well, they got to really get into the detail or the risk behind, um, behind you know, that portfolio that you may be acquiring. Rick, I, I know we've got two slides here to cover. I'll, I'll hand back to you just to go through, perhaps dig in more to what those um, attributes are talking about so our, our audience can really grasp this. Yeah, thanks, Camilla. So we talked about attributes as being uh, indexes with definitions that tie back to either a business or an individual. So specific characteristics that have something to do with, with the risk of that uh, that entity. And so from the person attribute standpoint, um, we include the different things that you typically want to know about your, your customer. And you think about their income or their profession, the assets, are there any issues with their identity? What about geographic risk? And criminal records, we talked about, you know, 90% of all criminal uh, cases are adjudicated in state courts. You know, is, is any of that, um, you know, something that you pick up in your current onboarding processes. And Cam just talked about his experience with, you know, getting an insurance product and all the information that's that's being requested there. The idea here is leverage another data source to gather most of that information where you can. It's scalable, it's efficient, and it allows for a better customer experience. So these are the, uh, the business uh, attributes, and they're very similar uh, in, in their concept to the person attributes. We're looking at income, assets, geography, et cetera, criminal, uh, civil and criminal records. But we also have operating characteristics. How many different locations do we see that business at, and are they active? Uh, Camille talked about you know, the, the risk of shell and, and shelf companies, and we've got information that uh, allows you to, to look at some different attributes that might tie back to a shell or a shelf company. And we also are able to link businesses back to their owners and executive officers. So not only looking at the business, but looking through the business to the, the people that are associated with it and, and some of the risk that may not be apparent if you're just looking at the business. So I'd like to take a look at one of the, well, actually two of the attributes um, so that you can uh, get an idea of specifically how they're, how they're built. I'm gonna take the state legal events and the offense types um, as an illustration. So the legal events, I mentioned a couple times that you know, 90% of uh, all crimes are adjudicated in the state court. So um, this, is a, this is a very important uh, attribute in assessing risk. And we look at here the recency and severity of the legal event. So looking at nine is, is whatever is we're measuring. If it's assets, it's going to be you know, a lot of assets. In this case, we're looking at um, you know, criminal records. So evidence of current incarceration is uh, you know, kind of a, the highest you can go. Um, and then we look at offense types, and this is the actual uh, uh, crime that was committed. And one of the things that we talked about earlier when we, we looked at, you know, different approaches to, to dealing with data and, and uh, machine learning is we actually applied machine learning to our criminal uh, records data because it's notoriously dirty, really. Um, every state has a different way of describing similar crimes. They have their different statutes. Um, the, the different people involved in creating those records, you know, judges, court officials, uh, law enforcement officials, they, they describe the crimes differently, they abbreviate them, they abbreviate them with misspellings. There's all sorts of uh, different ways that these same things are being represented. And so we apply supervised machine learning to really give you the opportunity to distinguish between different types of crimes if you're looking at money laundering um, and trafficking, that might be of, of concern to you as opposed to traffic violations. And so really 
applying the advanced uh, techniques to this type of data makes it even more uh, efficient and scalable. You really are able to drill down into the risk that you're trying to mitigate more easily. So I'm going to pass this over to Kimmel for the last couple slides in the presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. But if you could just talk about, uh, you know, some of the, the real-life examples that we see and how they can apply to, you know, our customers' problems, Kimmel, that'd be great. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, so I think just here giving you some examples, right, and I, I, what I love about the attributes or, or really the product suite in, in its entirety is it's the ability that you can customize to your uh, requirements, right? What do you want to look for? What is risky for you? And so um, Rick just talked about the, um, the legal event tying in with that offense type, which I think is just so powerful, right? That like when we think about negative news and that continuum, risk continuum that Rick was talking about, I want to know everything. I want to know something that's pertinent to me. So in, in, this, in this slide, I'm just sharing some examples where the icon, you've got that attribute, right? So we've got the business association attribute. And then we've got the two that we're pairing together, the state legal events and the offense type. And just two examples here. So you've got the attribute, and then it goes into the value um, of those attributes. And then you'll see that number, that numerical value is actually translated into you know, what it's really meaning, what the, what the sort of little bit of a summary of what that, that numerical value is meaning. So in this example, here you can see we've got somebody um, that's um, owner of an MSB, cash intensive. Those are oftentimes business types that we would want to be able to capture on or help explain perhaps heavy cash transactional activity um, you know, with this person's perhaps individual account or business accounts. And then you can see here pretty high um, numerical values assigned to their state legal and offense types, right? So we've got a felony conviction within the last three years. So that's really nice, I think, to be able to look at that from a time perspective. And that's related to potentially human drug, you know, weapon type uh, trafficking um, level um, offense types. And then again, same with person two, right? Still looking at this individual, we're looking behind the scenes, the characteristics, right, of this individual. Identify they're an executive of a law firm um, that it, that may have access into, you know, the, um, I guess, like sort of the, the financial services, right, without having much, um, perhaps without having much regulation or requirements strapped around them. Uh, and then also looking at the state legal events and the offense types there. So now we're looking at misdemeanor within the last three years, but still a pretty high offense, right? We've got a fraud-related offense there. So that just gives you the example, the detail that we can bring back for you. And where does this sit? We've kind of already talked about this. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of go through this, make sure we have time for, for questions, go through this quite quickly. But just imagine that entire customer life cycle all of those moments that you could utilize the attributes to be able to really, as an AML or compliance BSA professionals, be able to dig in and look at truly the characteristics of risk that those customers, whether individual or business, are presenting to you. Onboarding, ongoing, being able to manage higher risk customer accounts or relationships that you may have, and then, of course, being able to use the reports, not just to be able to dig into the underlying detail of those, um, of those individuals or businesses that have been identified within the attributes, but also being able to use those reports just in your FIU processes, in your due diligence processes. Quick note, too, before I pass over to Mary, you think about this as well outside of the perhaps um, traditional here bank process for anyone on the call who's maybe thinking about this from a vendor due diligence, supply chain, third party risk management, you know, just think about this where this can support you um, within those processes as well. Obviously probably a bit business heavy, 
but uh, and you know it, driven by U.S. sources here. So being able to help support perhaps that management of those vendors and suppliers, TPRM, within um, perhaps your U.S. side of your operations as well. Okay, so I think that's the last bit for me. Mary, I'm going to pass over to you. Um, okay. If, if you want to take control and, and look forward to, to the questions. Thank you, Mary. You bet. Thank you, Chris.